I would like to welcome on stage uh, James Brehm from um, the Market Research and Consultancy Company, who will moderate the panel for protecting water. Please, James, come on stage with also these uh, panelists, speakers, Corey Sides from Muller, Matt Peterson from Apana, and Ed Verham from Limnotech. Thanks, Remy. So we've got a great panel. Um, yeah, Never shift, I guess. Um, a great, great panel with um, some really interesting speakers up here. Um, but I wanted to, to point out, you know, when that last speaker asked how many people are worried, I didn't see enough hands raised. And I hope that we can talk about some of the solutions that are out there as well. My hand was raised, right? It's, it's, this water thing is a huge issue. The Nature Conservancy, a very conservative, actually, uh, organization, said by 2050 recently, a billion urbanites, right, in um, the, the Western world are gonna be living on 26 gallons of water or a bathtub full of water a day. Today, the average citizen is, is living off about 120 gallons. We're gonna be down to 26. How are we gonna do that? W with that in mind, you know, the topic of today's panel is, is about protecting water. And I'd, I'd like to have each of you guys kind of introduce yourself uh, with respect to that, that panel topic, protecting water with Laura Land and how it impacts your company, how it relates to your company, your day-to-day -day job, you know, and also personally, you know, why you're here. So we'll start with, uh, with Corey. Got it. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks for having me. Um, my name's Corey Sides. I lead our uh, technology solutions team uh, across the U.S. for Mueller Water Products. And at Mueller, uh, we're committed to building products and solutions that help water utilities deliver clean, safe drinking water. And this, this goes across a lot of different aspects of uh, flow management and flow control, system optimization, things like uh, uh, flow control valves, pressure regulating valves. Uh, we also provide digital solutions and technologies that connects all these devices and helps utilities to optimize their networks. These are things like acoustic leak detection systems, pressure management and optimi optimization systems, excuse me, to, uh, to help water utilities deal with water loss. Uh, specifically as it deals with Laura Wan, and I think one of our key areas, uh, something we just talked about is advanced metering infrastructure or AMI systems. And what these do, uh, these use Laura Wan networks, Laura Wan devices to allow water utilities to better account for their water. Before they can deal with the problems, they have to be able to measure it. And so this allows utilities to really figure out how much water they're pumping, where it's going throughout their system, so they can really get their hands around the problem and start to deal with it. Great. Ed? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Ed Verhamey. I'm a principal senior engineer at uh, Limno Tech in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I do environmental engineering consulting. Uh, all my work is on water. Uh, but, uh, you know, as opposed to most of the people here, I, I work on lakes, rivers, streams, so getting outside of water as a natural resource. And uh, that's, that's one of the challenges with Lorawan is is getting outside of these safe spaces, buildings, even our definitions of smart cities um, focus on the, the uh, built environment. Uh, so there's a lot of water challenges of, you know, where does this water come from? It comes from watersheds, it comes from wetlands. Uh, you, you get into uh, non-point non -point source pollution, which is agriculture, you get into land use. So there's a lot of use cases here that get a, a heck of a lot more challenging. And this, this space is used to that. The work that I do, we're, we're used to floods taking our sensors away. Um, and, and so one, one challenge that I wanna bring to this group is how to, how to get beyond the, the easy stuff, you know, the, the, the stuff we know Laura Wan can do. Yeah. And I think the real, value proposition for LoRaWAN is, is actual in this distributed co-owned ecosystem 
that blends outside of that utility infrastructure. I think other technology can't compete in that space. So I think you can absolutely compete inside buildings in this built environment. You're, you're going toe to toe with other tech, but there is no compatible uh, system, just a limitation. So when we, we work on the Great Lakes, nobody's covering the Great Lakes with cellular. It's, there's just not enough users, nobody's gonna point cellular gateways across large open bodies of water. But we can do that with LoRaWAN. So we, we are covering water and, and driving use cases, but the density trade-off isn't there, which is fine, because LoRa has a low cost to entry, you can scale it as you need to. So that's just a, just a brief introduction to my work. I'm excited to be here to sort of bring my water expertise to the technology folks and, and see how we can pull our interests and make sure we're also pointing our gateways out at our water resources, because I know there's lots of people that want to monitor water more. Yeah, great. And Matt? Yeah, hello, Matt Mar peterson with Apana. Um, I've been fortunate to call myself the CTO there for about a decade. Um, we focus on water use inside the fence line, so we've heard about the utilities and the source. We're working with um, commercial and industrial customers to help them manage water use in real time and historically inside their built environment, whether that's one building or many, many buildings spread across um, multiple continents in some cases. And uh, you know, we've heard some wild st statistics from a number of the panelists earlier and from James about water use, you know, how much water is actually getting to your tap in these facilities. We've been finding that once you're in the building, there's still a tremendous amount of waste there, right? We see typically on the average 20% water can be saved once you're inside the building. Um, it's pretty wild, it, it, scary stuff. The other, the other thing that really interests me and, and a reason I'm here is, is for business, obviously, that's our customer base. Of the 50% of, of the companies represented by the four most major stock exchanges have been labeled as medium to high risk for water, um, water issues going in the future, that's gonna impact bottom lines, right? You can't make whiskey if you don't have water. Um, when you buy a bottle of whiskey, how much water do you think goes into making that bottle, right? You're actually buying nine gallons of water with that bottle of whiskey. And we talk about water use inside the house, right? James threw out that, that number, 26 gallons, but really, how much water do you use throughout the day comes down to everything that you're consuming as well. And that, that point is, is important, right? 30% um, of the water in the United States goes into producing meat, right? That's a huge number, um, and one which we can improve upon to, to help, help um, this shortage that we're beginning to face. Great, thanks. So how do you define water protection, right? It's not like you put a security guard on it. Right? It's not like you just shut off the spigot. So, and each of you are gonna have, I think, a, a much different view of what water protection means, right? Um, but, but what does, can you, can you define what water protection means? Um, is it protecting the source, the supply, the quality? Is it the amount of usage? What do we need to be looking at? Let's start in the middle, Fed. Uh, you know, protecting water, um... If you're in the, I'd say the Western U.S., you're talking about quantity. You're, you're really getting into that, uh, you know, efficiency part. In the Eastern part of the U.S., a lot of our challenges are related to the quality of the water. Uh, so, uh, you know, when a lake is contaminated, uh, when there's algal blooms, hypoxia, you, 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 it's very expensive to treat the water. So protecting that is is looking at the quality and and the land use. Um, you know, where, where, where LoRaWAN and, and monitoring fits into this is, I, you know, no one likes funding monitoring. Uh, we, we have lots of challenges with uh, scientists being able to understand a system. And so you have to have, well, what, what next? What do you do with that data? And that's kind of where the protection part starts to come in. So it's, it's just thinking through, yes, you can get more sensors out there, but then what? then you have more data, well then what? So you just help, help your customers keep pushing that what forward and evaluate dollars, quantity, your impact. What, what's really surprising to me um, is we don't have a connection between investments in water and the return on quantity or quality. Um, I think there's a little bit easier connection to the 
dollars versus quantity because it's 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 right there. Uh, quantity is or quality is is really difficult, and we're often really removed from that. Um, I'd I'd like to see more basic quality monitors move into the home and provide the ability to provide feedback to just water utilities about the quality of the water. The, the distribution system is a living, breathing thing that, that the quality of water changes. That's, that's one thing that this industry could do is, is think about how to point of use work, rain gardens, you know, points, places where our citizens are gonna start getting. So that's what protection means to me is that quality sign. Matt? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's the whole thing, as, as we, we all know. We heard earlier uh, from Rich, we're 80% water, we all know that. There's, water, water is life, right? It, you gotta have it all, and it has to be clean, to your point. Um, I, from my point of view, and, and what we do, we look at it from that efficiency thing. What can we do to, to increase the supply of this finite resource? How can we make it last longer? And um, I think we're gonna hear some ideas around that from this panel and from the other people here. Um, but really, there's only so much on this planet and we're not really gonna get more of it. And so in my mind, it comes down to efficiency. How can we make it last longer? You know, how can, how can we reduce maybe by half what it takes to produce goods today? Um, that's, that's a key thing for us. Our customers who are producing things or running businesses, um, they look at ways and, and want to implement protection methods or, or efficiency, efficiency gains in their facilities by looking at maybe, uh, maybe they have you know, 100 buildings across their, their portfolio that are all producing the same thing in the same quantities, but one building uses 10 times as much as the other. Why? Right? Enabling people and organizations like this to actually have an impact on solving those problems, I think, is how we have a, a really good shot at protecting water. Corey? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's, uh, just add on to both of those, I think it's the whole thing. I mean, I think when you look at water, it, you know, we, it, it could be considered the most precious resource that we have. I mean, there is no life without it. And, you know, we, we deal a lot with the, the supply and the quantity and delivery of it to the end users, but I think when everybody wants to go home and know that when they turn the faucet on, there's gonna be clean water reliably coming out, you know, Global trade happens across our waterways. Droughts and disruption puts at risk labor markets and, and people's health. Um, we all wanna know that we have water available at our buildings, at our factories, at our offices to, to drive the economy. And so I think in terms of protecting that, it's, it's all the above because it, you know, it's, it's having uh, clean, safe drinking water at, at the critical points where we need it. You know, um some of the stats that I, I, I pulled up when I, when I first started prepping for this, 3% um, of electricity produced in the United States goes into water, right? Towards pumping it from an aquifer and getting it to the city or municipality. That's before it gets, 3% of that electricity is before it gets to a water treatment plant and has to go through the, those things, right? So if you can impact water, you impact power, right? And if you impact power, you also then conversely impact, impact water. So can you tell us a little bit about your organizations and who some of your customers are? So people out here understand who some of the people are that are on the forefront of actually doing some unique things. We'll start on this end again. Yeah, so at Mueller, our customers are the water utilities, like the water providers. These are the cities, the counties, regional water authorities across the globe. Um, you know, and we work with them a lot of different ways, kind of as I mentioned earlier, for, for things like reducing real water losses. Um, I would say specifically as it relates to Laura Wan, one of the key ways that we, we work with utilities is to deal with something called apparent losses. So when you look at water loss, uh, the first thing that you have to deal with as a, as a utility provider is what's called an apparent loss. And really this is just bad data, right? It's, hey, we're pumping water and we don't know where it goes. We don't know if we're losing it. We don't know if we're just not accounting for it right. So you have to deal with apparent losses first. And that, those losses can come from errors in billing and things like that. You know, they can come from old, you know, uh, old equipment that's no longer measuring accurately. 
So one of the ways that we use LoRaWAN with, with utility customers all across the globe is to deal with apparent losses. And so we provide you know, highly accurate measurement devices. Every, you know, most people in this room are, know those as water meters. And, and they're a key piece in dealing with water loss. And so utilities will install those at, at their production facilities, their plants, where their, their intakes, you know, their wells, things of that nature. They'll install those at key points throughout their system. Uh, we call those DMAs or district metered areas. And then ultimately they install those at everybody's houses out here and all of our businesses and production facilities. And then we use LoRaWAN to connect all those devices to a single server. And so we can look at, at reliable data that's distributed all across of a distributed network that covers the entire city or county that we're in. And then they can take, use analytics and make actionable insights. So for example, they can say, hey, from midnight last night until midnight the night before, I pumped 10 million gallons of water. And I sold 900,000 or 9 million gallons of water. So they can get their arms around how much did I really pump, how much did I sell, and that, that helps you figure out what those real losses are. Those DMAs help utilities say, okay, those are installed on trunk mains or, or key areas, so they can say my biggest problems appear to be over here in my distribution system so that they can then start to dig in with solutions that help solve real losses through leaks and breaks and things like that. So that's just, again, one example of how we're using LoRaWAN to help our, our, our customers, which are water utilities across the globe, try and deal with water loss by really just getting good data to figure out where those issues are. Matt, what do your customers look like? What's your organization serve? Yeah, yeah, so um, like I mentioned earlier, commercial, industrial, we're inside the fence lines. Um, but the, the parallels between the story that we just heard and what we do are, are the same, right? Bigger, bigger distribution systems here inside the fence lines and in, in the buildings that we're in. So um, customers of ours, um, I, I put some slides out there for reference after this, you can, you can see our, some of our customers there. Costco Wholesale, um, we look at mon water inside of their buildings, um, both inside and outside, right? They have a, kind of an operations footprint inside the building and then things happening outside like irrigation. Uh, so we sensorize in multiple places like that. Some of our other customers are, are bigger, bigger industries. I mentioned meats. Uh, we work with um, meat producers to do these things, and that looks much more like the larger system that um, Corey was talking about earlier, but packed into a plant where you may have a plant that's consuming millions of gallons of water per day with pipes going everywhere. It's, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever walked in one, but it's kind of a, it's wild, right? It's a spaghetti factory of pipes. And it's, it's hard to manage what you can't measure. I think everybody can agree with that. Water, very much true in that case. And these, these factories, they're not, they're not sensorized out of the gate. And so the operators don't exactly see where all the water is going all the time. You may get your, your monthly water bill, or in some cases that's improved a lot, right? They're getting daily measurements from the utility. But when you're trying to manage millions of gallons a day with actionable information, you need more points around a system to do that. And so that's, that's where we come in and we add more monitoring points to it. You know, tying it back into LoRa and LoRaWAN, one thing I like to think about with, with the, the IoT acronym, where we was talking about IoT and LoRaWAN, there's a, there's a letter missing off of the acronym IoT. When you say it out loud, you say the Internet of Things, right? That S is important. You need many things in there to make the real value come out of these things for operational gains. And so that could be more than one measuring point or, hey, maybe this is a hot water feed, is, is the water hot enough? How much energy are we using to produce that water? Now, now we're wasting hot water, oh, this is really expensive, right? You use all those different things to, to bring the value to the customer and, and realize that. Ed? Yeah, I think our, our, our business is built, if you think about the water, the water treatment plant, you know, before water becomes processed water for a plant, it's a lake or river or stream. So you're, you're projecting where does that water come from, what's that water body look like? And I think the challenge and the, and the value proposition for LoRaWAN is if you're outfitting that water utility, um, ask them where's your water coming from? Do you want to also cover your reservoir and as much of your uh, headwaters as possible? You might not use it today, but we know that's, you know, they, they all have source water protection plans. Those are all very, very strong documents that talk about their commitment to source water protection, yet they have very little ability to actually monitor that because, because they said it's not feasible or possible. 
And I think LoRaWAN is changing that. So, you know, how do, how do we leave in these uh, future placeholders to transition to another partner that might know more about that? And I think that that is one unique aspect of the LoRaWAN ecosystem versus others is this, you know, the same tech can be out in the field, it can come into the plant, it can also hop over to that wastewater treatment plant or that, yeah. that other utility that has a discharge that you have to manage its impact on the water body. There's a lot of, lots of issues with, uh, uh, you know, NPDES permits for these facilities and their impact and special permits. So these, you know, we get involved in industrial facilities and they say, you know, the state agency has a problem with our water or we're going for a special mixing zone use case and we have, we're, we're paid to monitor their lake or stream. And Lord, they don't cover LoRaWAN, doesn't, it's not compatible. So it just for all these facilities, you know, leave in placeholders for someone else to come along. And I, I think it helps build the use case for why LoRaWAN is a good solution because it is, does offer this compatibility. So the, that's where we're, you know, our, our value has always been for as a company on special studies. Uh, and there's, there's no competition in those spaces. It's, it's challenging, it's, you, you have to be experts on the water system. And so the technology, it's not that it's irrelevant, it's just it, it could be useful if there is an intentional aspect to it. So this urban planning and where sensors go and where they could go, I think that's, that's what we should think about more here. So um, I don't want this to just be the James asks these guys questions show, right? If you guys have any questions from the audience, there's microphones in the center, just come down to the center um, and we'll call on you for, for those. But one of my customers drug me out to a city in West Texas a few years ago. This city in West Texas um, decided, you know, it needed to sensorize the stuff that it has. Outside of that city, small city, there's a reservoir. In between that reservoir and the city, right, they, they had mass, some massive flooding a few years ago. Um, and the property owners of that land between the reservoir and the incorporated city wanted to sue the city because the city owns the reservoir, right, for flooding. They were able to actually utilize the sensor data from the pumps that they put on at that reservoir to show the pumps never turned on, so the reservoir never went over its top. All the flooding came just from the sky, not from the flooding of the reservoir. Right? They were able to pay, take care of their legal fees from that sensor data, which actually paid for them then implementing mm -hmm. a full city deployment of meters. They got the meters in, started looking at the data, and they thought they were the most efficient city in all of the world from the data that they got out, the, 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 that type of data. What they realized is they had this huge billing hole. Right? They forgot to turn on the new subdivision. They were not billing right, for a full third of the water meters deployed in that city. So I, those are both aspects of, wow, this is really great that you were able to utilize data for something other than and pay for your, your solution. And this is also a bonehead moment, right? So what, can you guys talk about a little bit about some of the things you've encountered in your, I guess I'll call it a conservation journey, right? Um, both good or bad, right? What are the aha moments that you've gotten here? And Corey, let's... Yeah, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, again, we talked about earlier, one of the challenges, like you just mentioned, that we try and help is, is helping utilities deal with bad data. Um, and that's the, kind of the first area we target. But then usually that opens up the door to, okay, now that I know my real losses are this, what do I do about it? And it can be a... I'll just say a very daunting problem. I think, and I'll, I'll butcher the number, but you know, the, the American Society of Civil Engineers forecasts, I can't remember how many trillions of dollars are needed here in the US for our aging infrastructure. And you know, while there are, have been an uptick in federal funds and things like that, pardon the pun, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to, to what it would take to replace. Um, there, there's just not, not money to do it. By the way, the average age of pipes in the United States 48 years right now, yeah. water oh, pipes. Yeah, and, and, so. and, and, and that's probably, it, it's higher on the East Coast than as yeah. you go West, it goes yep. down like this. So it's, it's well over 100 years in, in a lot of the Eastern part of our yep. US. Um, 
So it's a, it's a big problem. They don't have, the, I think one of the challenges we talk about, they don't have the funds to really deal with. They don't have the funds to replace it. So we try and help them, hey, how can we provide technology? How can we provide digital solutions to extend the life of it, to do more with less? Um, these are things like you know, pressure optimization systems where you know, a utility might say, okay, uh, I know I have leaks, I know I have issues, but I'm gonna set you know, a desired pressure at this point in my system Maybe it's your point of highest demand. Maybe it's your, your highest elevation in your system, which is gonna have your lowest pressure. And then automate, you know, regulating the pressure to meet those critical points. So at, at night, things like that, when, when your demand goes down, utilities can lower their system pressure. You know what that, that means that less water is lost through leaks. You're putting less uh, stress on those pipes um, so that you can extend the asset life. And then when, uh, you know, people wake up and factories start up and people are using water at those critical periods of demand, you can automatically increase those pressures to meet what's needed. So, you know, this is just kind of one example of how we're trying to help utilities extend asset life and do more with less because the funds aren't there to, to, to really go replace, which is what's needed in a lot of areas. And so we, we try and help them do more with less, if that makes sense. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the shameless plug. So I have aha moments every day, and if folks want to follow me on Twitter, uh, Eddie, Eddie Great Lakes on Twitter. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, the technology part, it's, it, it's changing so fast, and there's, it's, it's such a densification of options yeah. that it's almost, that's, it, it's not that it's not a challenge, it's, it's the customer's needs and, and how they frame their challenges and what they think is possible, is, it, that is the challenge. So these, these aha moments uh, focus from helping our clients uh, like rethink that problem today out in the open with us, and then we can propose the you know actually this Loroan this this is really great for that problem. They don't know what that means. It leads to more conversation. So the the aha moment comes through this discussion of their of their problem. And I think you know it goes goes back to that sort of show me the money. Once once you start showing them the value uh, and you know I know all the where all the data is going and all the data packets and stuff um, that's that's their aha moment is that immense scalability and this rethinking of a problem I think everyone gets siloed with their procurement methods you've got to shatter their procurement system first you got to get ahead um, all, all the people we work with are are so hamstrung by how they can even talk about their problems, um, how to go through internal internal processes for um, you know these innovation, which is which is why the earlier talk showing that well it's actually the IT departments which are leading it, and it's not because they're better at the application; they're just a, you know holding space for new things. So that's that's where I tend to try and push my efforts, and where these aha moments go a lot faster. Yeah, good technology doesn't fix stupid all the time, right? We've had process uh, well, or, or changed process. Yeah, I mean, view. I mean, you know, like you're bringing up this. Yeah. Everyone is revamping technology now, and it's 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 accelerating. And so every touch point you have with a customer now is an opportunity to move in a different direction, uh, which is a challenge and an opportunity. So, Matt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely some some really big successes to share. Um, I think about a couple examples that you brought up with the the wastewater systems and and you know the impacts that water use can have on those, especially in, in big industries. Um, one recent win that we had, um, which sort of helped solve some of the problems I think that that we have to think about when we do these things for organizations that have existing systems like BMS or whatever they're running their their plant with, is that. You know, these, these IoT solutions that come in are keeping an eye on things, if you will, can come in and look like big, big brother, right? Big brother's there, and, you know, it's coming from a sustainability officer who's trying to get ESG goals. But really, we show them how we can enable both that sustainability officer and the guy running the plant to, to actually reduce water and be more efficient. And once everybody gets on board with that, you get some really cool wins. One, going back to that wastewater, is um, in, a, in a process plant, a, a meat plant that we've been in recently, you know, big boilers in these places, right? Boilers that are three of them as big as this room type. They take, fill up this room. And there, there's this thing called the flash tank cool down, right? There's water coming out of those that's boiling that goes down the drain. 
well, you can't put hot water into the sewer because it starts to kill off all the, all the bugs in the biosphere that's breaking that stuff down and doing the wastewater treatment plant thing. Well, to cool that down, they're, they're mixing in cold water. And we found that line there to be consuming, you know, 80,000 gallons a day going down the drain just to cool the water down. And by sensorizing that and getting in some other information from their plant controllers that say, how, how cold does it actually need to be? We were able to reduce that down to 8,000 gallons a day, right? That's a 26 million gallon a year savings on just one point in their system. And so, you know, once, once the plant engineers get on board with that and they see how they can really have an impact, um, it helps them scale these initiatives across their organization. Um, that's one, and another one I'd share is, is doing that same enablement, but with people that have many, many facilities across um, a large geographic area like the United States. Uh, I think we heard from Rich earlier about how many municipalities there are in the US, and the number keeps changing in my brain. It's like 30 or 50,000, right? If you're trying to manage water use in buildings in every state, it's really hard to get one system to do that, right? And so, you know, enabling organizations to manage water use in real time across the United States or maybe North America is huge, right? You, it's hard to compare water bills. You may not get an hourly read or a daily read or even a monthly read. Um, across you know, municipalities at that kind of a scale. And so it's really fun to see organizations latch onto that, have initiatives they're driving um, from an ESG perspective all the way down to their frontline staff that can actually have an impact and get those reductions. By the way, factoid, 148,000 public water districts in the United States. 148,000. Right? 148,000. In the UK, there's 32. Right? So how we handle this really changes around the world. I think there was a question out here before, so. Hello, yeah, thank you. I think Corey answered part of it, but uh, we are running some POCs with the Puerto Rico Water Company, and the main objective is uh, leakage or losing production. Uh, how do you foresee uh, what to measure and, and where do you foresee where, you know, uh, how many sensors are where in the arteries, the trunks, the capillary, and, and what? that You mentioned pressure as one of them, but if you have, uh, you're still uh, pumping, uh, you know, the delta in pressure, it's, it's the, probably you, you won't see it. Uh, there's anything else that we have to measure? Um, I mean, that's a great question. So I think uh, you started on the right track. Like, in order to, to deal with the problem, you first have to measure it. Right, and so it's, it's getting accurate data from your sources, you know, how much water are you pumping? It's using things like DMAs, your trunk lines to figure out where, those, uh, where that flow is going. Um, and then it's how much water you're selling. So then you can start to deal with it with things like pressure regulating, pressure optimization systems. Uh, there are also a lot of great acoustic leak detection technologies out there today. Um, which will help you try and figure out where are those points of water loss um, and correlate those. Uh, a lot of utilities kind of say, hey, I, I know I have leaks, but I don't, I, I don't have the ability or the money to go and fix all of them. So there's a lot of technologies today which will actually help you measure the amount of water being lost through those leaks and say, okay, um, I'm measuring, if I've got 10 leaks, you know, eight of them may be accounting for 5% of my water loss and two of them are accounting for, you know, the other 95%. You want to go fix those two, right? Um, you know, and I think when you combine those technologies, you can try and find that point in your system where you can manage your pressure so that their sales of water, which is something that, hey, utilities have to do. Um, you know, it's an ugly truth. Reducing pressure reduces the amount of water lost through leaks, but it also reduces the amount of water you sell through your showers and your, your, your system, which is something you need to maximize, right? So where's that economic point uh, within your system where you can manage your pressure to say, okay, this is the optimal point where I'm reducing water loss, uh, yet also getting the revenue that I need. So, I mean, that's one example of areas that you can kind of look in to try and manage um, um, water loss. Does that answer the question? Great, we're, we're down to about a minute, I think. Um, we can keep going if, if we want to, but are we good on time, Sky or uh, Brenna? Good. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a lightning round real quick, right? If we if we sat here, right, 
a year from now, and we're going to talk about this. Are we talking about something different? Are we hashing out the same old things? Seems like there has been challenges in water for a number of years, right? And it seems like, but it seems like the, the volume and the intensity is, is really picking up. I don't want us to be a, a 12 step program for people that are running out of water either, right? But what are we talking about next year at this time? Um, I mean, I, I'd love to say something different, um, but I think the, the challenges we have to deal with that, that I still think we're struggling with are apathy and, and like developed nations. We still use water like it's an unlimited resource and we don't charge enough for water, right? I think that when you look at, at the, it's the most precious resource we have, uh, we have to treat it like that. We have rapidly escalating costs to produce and not rapidly escalating prices that we're selling. And, and until we deal with that imbalance and, and again, the apathy, it, it's gonna be a challenge. Okay. Yeah, I'd, this time next year, I'd like to see the, you know, there's, there's a lot of other players in water, and I think I'm not, trying not to have this space duplicate effort elsewhere. So there's, there's challenges with government adopting LoRaWAN, uh, or even technology period. So how, how, how do we have more government focuses on why that's happening? So I think it's, you know, try, trying to shift this from, yes, we can do this, there's a lot of really good use cases and value, but there's still a lot more to go in terms of that adoption and, and transition. So try, trying to push these panels on like who, who isn't in this room and why and, and how do we get them here next year? Yeah, I think we've been hearing about solutions that, that, that can help solve the problem. We need to see the adoption of that, right? That's what I hope we'll be up here talking about next year is, okay, here's some solutions that actually enable organizations to have an impact, you know, when, when 30% of the water in the U.S. goes to just producing meat. That's, that's a big number that we can have an impact on. Um, and organizations are now have tools available to them to do things. And you know, with Laura, Laura Wan, not only can you do water, you can do all these other ancillary things around it that are gonna make your operations efficient, right? And so the, the value prop should pay for these things quickly, and we, we know it does. We need the adoption, and how do we get that? Maybe we get it through mandates, right? And through, through, through the government to say we, we must do these things. Great, I'll throw my two cents in. You know, municipalities, cities, water districts, talk about resilience and sustainability. The rest of the world, there's, you know, 30 publicly traded stock exchanges out there that have ESG mandates. All those stocks have, have an ESG mandate. How do, you, how do you hit your mandate? Is it gonna be through the smoke and mirrors and just mathematical calculations that they're doing it now, or is it through the true measurement, through technologies, uh, the sensor technologies and the connectivity that LoRaWAN brings? So I think that's, that's what we need to do, so. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Give them applause, guys. I think it'd be great. <laughs>